Chris with Cowdog here, and in this video, I am making a massive timber framing mallet from Ash, also known as a Commander. This is built almost entirely with cutoffs from the biggest dining table I ever did. I'll have that video linked up in the corner. And that was nice because all the stock was S4S and pretty much ready to work with off the bat. And I started by cross cutting the stock that I used for the mallet head glue up. Now a lot of times in smaller mallets, folks will glue the pieces up in such a way to accommodate for the tenon on the handle. But as I'm a bit of a masochist with my hand tools sometimes, I'm just going to glue this huge block and we'll mortise it out later. And whenever I'm doing a glue up that's basically a giant brick of wood, it never comes out perfect out the clamps. And frankly, I didn't really try all that hard to keep the pieces from sliding around in the glue up. I did just enough to make it usable. So to remedy that, I just square everything up with hand planes. <laughs> now the idea is that I want the top and bottom to be square to the sides and I use my square to draw a line on the end grain so that I can see where my high spots are by marking from the low point square across the block. Then I chamfer down to the line and then bring the plateaued area down to that line. And this process is also repeated on the end grain in similar fashion. And after I've got everything nice and square, I go ahead and throw a small baby chamfer around all the end grain. The layout with almost all joinery and timber framing processes is the most tedious, but candidly the most important. I'm marking out on top and bottom where the mortise for the handle will be. I begin by marking center and then from that center point, crossing through it from end to end and side to side. I use those lines as guides to mark the width and length of the mortise and then square those off to match the stock I'm using for the handle. Then, since I'm shouldering the mallet handle, I'll use the width of the sashigane as the difference between my shoulder and tenon. Once again, this video is sponsored by the Home Depot Prospective. I'm working with Diablo Tools this year and chose a couple tools that I thought would be pretty nifty for some of my timber framing goals this year. For starters, a 17.5 inch long auger bit with 1 inch diameter. If you're into construction, this thing is no joke and I'm using it here to try to hog out the bulk of the mortise waste. Try to keep it straight and mind your wrists. Next up are these carbide oscillating tool blades for your multi-tool. It's a little known fact, but when I remade my Kana, I actually ended up using a multi-tool to do the relief cuts in the throat, which I eventually chiseled out. Here I'm basically doing a similar application. Lots of little plunge cuts to try and get the areas between my auger bit holes and clear as much out before I get to it with hand tools. These carbide blades with their proprietary black ice coating have a fairly long life. If you're used to other brands, you'll notice that the teeth basically disappear after a couple cuts. These stay fresh longer and mine are actually still good despite the abuse I put them through here. And I'm of the mind that doing the hard work with the multi-tool saved me from having to sharpen my chisels a thousand times to do the exact same thing. All these tools will be linked in the description and pinned in my comments. Speaking of comments, if you're new here to the channel, thanks for watching. Also, if you're a returning subscriber, well, I guess sorry to keep disappointing you. With that being said, go ahead and like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, and give that notification bell a little tickle, just a little bit, right on the little dangly bell part, so you'll never miss any of my upcoming builds. You can also follow along on my other social channels. I'm at Cowdog Craftworks on everything. Back on a more educational note here, a big joinery principle that I was taught and continue to preach is that end grain should be severed before moving to cross grain material. Number one, it makes removal of the cross grain material easier, but secondly, it allows for cleaner corners and smoother cross grain walls. And if the last couple minutes didn't make it evident, I like to use jigs from scrap wood to maintain angles. As you can see here when I'm checking for square, it takes a lot of the guesswork out on figuring whether you're going to be square across the interior of your mortise. 
A lot of mallets I've seen are wedged from the top. However, a while back I made a drawboard mallet for myself, never made a video, and it's still strong as ever and works great. So since drawboard is a big timber framing concept, I found it apt to do the same here. So after marking for center, I drilled the sides with the one inch auger bit. I cannot emphasize enough how important making sure you're going straight down here is. If you're not at 90 degrees or at least within a degree or two, you're going to have an extremely bad time. and then back to the hand plane to get all my marking lines off. Now the handle is also ash and I'm marking out the tenon and the respective shoulders. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do for a handle design. I'm not super imaginative in that regard and I wanted to be able to use this mallet to uh, both sides of the head. So I used the end of my grandfather-in-law's old hatchet to create a little detail on the end to keep it from slipping through my fingers when in use. The handle itself is about 30 inches long and I oversized the tenon in length as a just-in-case precaution. And on the table saw, just to speed things up, I'm making some stopped cuts. I have a piece of blue tape marked on the fence. When my shoulder line gets to the top side of the tape, I shut the saw off, wait for the blade to stop, and then flip to the other side. Then after that, I'll just finish everything up with the handsaw. So this part was particularly miserable. I don't have a bandsaw anymore and I wasn't particularly good with the bandsaw to begin with. Uh, anyway, I'm cutting a number of relief cuts up to my pattern with the jigsaw. I don't use the jigsaw much and at first I remembered, hey, there's dust collection. And then I realized that when I'm actually trying to follow the line on the piece, the dust collection hose gets in the way of the work piece, which created a whole nother issue. So I had to take the hose off and then just get dusty again. And this ash is fairly thick, one three quarters if I remember correctly. So this whole process was slow and tedious. I actually couldn't even use a scroll blade either to have better curves because of the fact that the ash was so thick. And to be clear, that's thick with two C's, not just one. It's been a while since I've done any power carving and I thought this would be a fun little exercise in it. I've got one of those cuts all extra coarse discs that I used previously when I built the spear gun from Rosewood. I should add these power carving discs and candidly angle grinders in general kind of get me all nervous from a safety perspective. So anyway, I'm going full Monty here with an apron, dust mask, eye protection, even welding gloves. Also one of the reasons I dislike power carving is how dusty it is. So I ended up putting an air mover on my workbench to try and direct the dust in a particular way. Needless to say, my wife wasn't thrilled when she went to work the next day and it looked like the sky snowed sawdust on her car. I don't have a ton of great advice on power carving except to just be soft handed. And what I mean like that is I don't even grip the tool all that hard. Just try and keep light pressure. I find if you're really tense, you're going to dig in a bit too much and these aggressive discs can bite deep in your work real quick. After I use the disc, I take a medium rasp and try to start smoothing things out a little bit better. And then I'm on to a flat bottom spoke shave. And then here's just a really sharp, small Stanley block plane. And 
and then my Diablo sand block with sand mat. And then finally a card scraper. I tend to like to push my card scrapers on flat workbench height surfaces, but in this instance, it just felt more comfortable and was way more effective on the pole. For the draw bore, I'm marking the center of the hole on the tenon, disassembling the mallet, and then marking toward the shoulder about 1 16th of an inch. Then drilling the tenon and whittling down the end of a red oak dowel, which will pin the joint and bring the mallet head tighter towards the handle. Now hammering this sucker in was tough. These one inch dowels do not really want to bend, but eventually it got through. Uh, I went just with a store-bought dowel from Home Depot. It was certainly faster than making my own. I trimmed the excess off with a curved multi-tool blade. I initially thought I wanted to leave the peg proud, but after I stared at it for a minute, decided to just flush it up, and then I cut a little bit of the excess at the top of the handle tenon. The purpose of this mallet is to knock large joint beams together and I'm anticipating that to be mostly softer construction grade wood. Since ash is pretty hard, a marring preventative is in order, I'm going with cork rubber, also known as crubber, for one face. And I'll apply that with some basic contact adhesive. This stuff is widely available, cheap, and pretty easy to apply. I use it to attach leather to my workbench vices, and that's actually the same exact can from over a year ago. Cutting the crubber off is definitely something I was not good at. Even using the workpiece as a guide, I couldn't seem to cut it straight. But ultimately it's fine, and when it eventually wears off, or wears out I should say, I'll just remove and replace it. For finish, I'm once again going with Real Milk Paint Company's Wood Wax. I've said it before and I'll say it again, it's my favorite finish on the market right now. It's easy to apply, all natural, and cures quick. Wipe it on and wipe it off. Everything including the crubber gets a healthy dose. Use coupon code COWDOGCRAFTWORKS for 10% off at their website. And with such a huge piece of hardwood, you know I could not help myself around this big mallet energy. You can almost taste the awkwardness. And it's official, that is a huge piece of ash. That's it for the build itself. Lots of work, fairly simple, and will probably outlast me. Now, let's go do some stupid stuff with it. So this mallet is not actually designed for smashing fruit or other items, but I know that if I don't do something of this nature or sort, uh, I'm probably never gonna hear the end of it. So let's start by uh, trying this with an apple. Wrap the head in plastic wrap to try to keep all the fruit guts off the finish. <laughs> I just exploded an apple. I'm gonna try potato next. And for the final test of my big mallet energy, let's see if we can just smoke this cantaloupe. Ugh, well, that was extremely therapeutic. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks.